All right, welcome back everybody. Another video from Orbital. This time we're gonna debrief the NBA draft, which was last night. All the picks are in. A lot of people are moving around still, so uh, Rourke and I are just gonna kind of give our, our thoughts the morning of uh, before, before any more moves happen today. Uh, but what we're gonna do, we're gonna pick three winners and a few losers from the team. Rourke, and now, uh, starting off the bat, who do you think was your biggest winner um, from, this, from this NBA draft? Biggest winner, hmm. I think you go a lot of different places with this. I'm going to take an interesting route with my pick. I'm going to take a team that no one's really talking about, player no one's really talking about, with the Indiana Pacers. And now, you know, the Indiana Pacers, they only had a one pick in the draft, and it wasn't even a first-round pick. It was very late in the second round, the 54th pick. So, you know, there's only 60 picks, yeah. you know, John, in the first two rounds of the draft. And this guy goes 54, Cassius Stanley out of Duke. A guy who's been talked about, has a great frame, great build, very, very athletic, had the highest vertical in the draft. And he looks like he could be, you know, fun, be able to be developed. Yeah, he had the highest vert in the draft. Um, I'm almost positive on that. You check, you check, fact check me. But, um, and he ends up going 54th, a guy who was projected to go either late first round, early second round, ends up somehow falling all the way to the bottom. The Pacers only had one pick in the draft. You got to pick someone who's got potential to break out, right? You don't, you know, they're not looking for a role player. They have a lot of good pieces already in Indiana. And, you know, with the loss of Brogdon, you know, they need another forward, you know, type guard, obviously Brogdon's point guard, shooting guard, but they're looking for more pieces that can contribute now. You know, they don't want a guy who they have to develop a lot. And if you have one of the last picks in the second round, and you get a player like Cassius Stanley who's already developed in that way that can make an instant impact for the Pacers, I think they're a big winner in the draft. Now, there's a lot of winners, a lot of people we talk about loss. What about you, John? Who did you see as one of the biggest winners in the draft? Gotcha. So I think if I have even my, my top three, um, and I, you know, I've read a couple articles already this morning just kind of talking about who, who everyone's kind of slating as the winners of the draft. So I'm going to try and be a little more contrarian to this or do a little more digging uh, than the, the picture you're going to see in other articles. But really, to me, uh, my number one winner is Golden State, right? Getting Wiseman at number two, who, honestly, if Wiseman maybe stays the whole college season, and maybe we're talking about him as a clear-cut number one. Uh, I mean, the guy's seven foot, if not seven plus, uh, has a mid-range jumper already that can easily stretch out to the three-point line. Uh, and most, most importantly, he fits their their needs, right? They need a big man. And especially someone, it, usually when you talk about that, the Warriors are in the running for someone who's a veteran center that they're going to get under a mid-level exception or the veterans minimum in free agency. Like not a number two overall pick, maybe someone who could even be the number one overall pick if we saw more of him, right? Like usually that's not the guy uh, that, uh, that a NBA championship team a couple of years ago gets. So I think that was an awesome pickup for them. Uh, and then second was Nico Mannion uh, in the second round, nonetheless. Uh, getting a lot of hype about that guy. Yeah, getting, getting a piece like that so late in the draft, uh, I thought was a steal. Someone who was in a lot of mock drafts supposed to go in the first round. So obviously you're getting a, a talented player, uh, you know, a big, big mixtape legend, uh, I, I guess. But uh, I think on a team that has such a great culture like the Warriors do, I can see Nico developing pretty – uh, pretty favorably down there. Another team I really liked, actually, and you and I have talked about this right before, I actually like the Spurs draft. And, you know, that is up for, you know, debate in terms of how they'll benefit. I, we're not really going to know until the season starts and we see their guys play. But they are, you know, went out. And I would say, you know, would you agree with me that the Spurs are almost kind of like a guard-heavy roster to begin with? You know, say, especially with the two draft picks they did, now they are if they weren't before. So, Absolutely. Yeah, because, you know, they got young pieces already with, you know, Jante Murray, you know, Derek White, uh, you know, they got veteran Patty William, uh, Patty, Patty Mills, but then they also got Lonnie Walker, right, who, you know, they just drafted a lot of buzz, a lot of hype about him, and so now you bring in Trey Jones and um, Basel, and I think that, you know, obviously that lottery pick, you know, that's going to pay off. I think, you know, he's going to return some real value, you know, Devin Vassell, but Trey Jones, guy I wanted to highlight, reason why I picked the team was he slipped kind of later in the second round. He was a guy who was projected to go at the end of the first. A lot of talent, uh, played with great players at Duke, obviously. He's got his older brother, Tyus, too, who's in the NBA, one of your favorite players. And, you know, Trey Jones <laughs> Trey Jones is, uh, I think, could, could be a good NBA point guard, backup point guard in the league. Uh, so how the Spurs manage all these guards going forward remains to be seen. 
but you know they're you know they they've talked about moving to Rose and they've talked about moving Aldridge. You know maybe they pair him with with one of these young pieces uh, that they also have in their guards and they can get someone really good a good a good forward or a good you know small forward guard whatever. And you mentioned the Spurs. Yeah, I think it's an incredibly um, crowded front court because you do still have to roast on the books unless you move them to the Lakers, which honestly, I don't know if the Devin Vassell move makes like just shows that they are going to trade DeRozan to the Lakers or at least keeping their options open for that. Uh, but Vassell is, a, you know, he's going to be a weird pick for some just because, you know, the Spurs always like to kind of go left field with their, with their draft picks, but I mean, he's a defensive guard at six, six. So he can, he can match up, uh, really, we can complement well with Dejounte Murray in terms of being two guards in a big in a big backcourt. Uh, if if Derozan obviously does get moved, but he averaged over a steal and a block a game uh, in college, which is someone something that not a lot of players do, uh, even in the NBA. So let let alone, let alone college. So I think that's a really cool thing to look at. Trey Jones will be a really solid pick for them. Again, a defensive guard like you mentioned. Uh, I think that's a great pick. I also had the Detroit Pistons. Uh, in, in my top three, just because of the pieces they got uh, with a team that's always rotated there, trying to find their star point guard, whether it's Reggie Jackson or Rodney Stuckey uh, a few, a long, long time ago, uh, Brandon Knight, Brandon Jennings. Like they have had a lot of point guards come through that they've said, maybe this will be the guy, uh, but really getting a guy in Killian Hayes. Uh, so just having a guy at 6'5", a good frame for a point guard, one of the best pick and roll players in the draft that now you can pair with Christian Wood. I mentioned this uh, on our TikTok channel earlier today, why I think Killian Hayes fits the Detroit Pistons pieces they already have really well. Getting him, getting a big five and a rebounder and Isaiah Stewart, and then also uh, getting Sadiq Bey, who can stretch the floor at the four position and be a backup to Christian Wood. Uh, those, those in terms of just out of the draft, those are great pickups, uh, but also something that you're not going to hear a lot of people talk about, but just getting Trevor Ariza on the roster. I think is a plus, especially for a team that's looking to rebuild, gain a veteran presence like Trevor Ariza that's uh, going to be able to teach these players how to be a pro. Uh, I think the Detroit Pistons did a great job uh, with the picks that they had available in this draft and came out a winner. Uh, my third pick uh, was the Nuggets just because they've got R.J. Hampton uh, very late in the draft. I know he didn't do super well in Australia this past year, but I think getting him at 24th uh, just like is reminiscent of picking up Michael Porter Jr., uh, last year or two years ago. Uh, I think just getting a guy that event that at one point was supposed to be the number one pick at 24 for a future first round pick to the Pelicans. I think a uh, great pickup for them. I think they're a huge winner. Yeah. Well, real quick, bouncing off what you said, RJ Hampton, a guy who I, yeah, I really like in the draft did not have a good last year, but is definitely reminiscent of that Michael Porter jr. Almost like Bobo. Bobo went in the second round, but just oh, the type right. of count, right? Like everyone's sleeping on him. And the fact that the nuggets were able to draft, who not only they wanted with their first round was Zeke and Najee. I know I probably just destroyed that name, but um, <laughs> you know, they, 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 they came out and said they were targeting him. And then they're also able to get RJ Hampton too. So I really think that, you know, the Nuggets were able to pull off some good moves and get a potentially great player. Like you said, RJ Hampton was projected to go number one in this draft a couple of years ago. And so good for them. Um, but one team I actually want to point out that, you know, I, I, I echo also, all of your other picks that you said the Warriors crazy, especially with that Ubre trade they pulled off. You know, it's unfortunate yeah. for Clay Thompson. News coming out, he tore his Achilles today. But able now to trade for Ubre. You, you and I talked about their starting lineup they're going to have with Curry, Wiggins, Ubre, Wiseman, and you know Draymond Green. You know, Green's going to play the four. But point is, they got three young pieces. Well, I guess Wiggins is kind of mature now, but you got Curry and Draymond who been there, done that. They've gone through everything they need to get, you know, they're, they're on their own pace. They can win another championship with just some pieces around them. You know, if Curry's healthy, I don't, you know, it's hard for any team to beat the Warriors. And so now you bring in this young talent of Wiseman who you talked about. It's almost like reminiscent of Tim Duncan and with David Robson getting hurt, they get another star who's debatably the best pick in the draft. And yeah. so with this new team, the Warriors going to be stacked and fortunate for Clay though really sucks that he went down one team I want to highlight though uh the draft that I thought could have done better I guess um the Chicago Bulls and I feel like this is an easy pick for a lot of people and I think you and I should talk about this a little bit because you know the Chicago Bulls end up picking Patrick Williams with the fourth pick a guy who you know he's a really good player uh, apparently in high school top prospect you know projected to go top 10 I guess uh, comes off the bench in Florida one, one six man of the year 
um, fell out of top 10 projections, I would say, mm-hmm. or maybe, or if, if so, he was late in them uh, yeah. coming into the draft night, but someone who was highly talented and recruited ended up going to Florida competition there has to play his role or whatever. And, you know, ends up being the sixth man of the year, but comes off the bench in college and somehow slides into the fourth pick of the draft. Now, it just seems really weird. It just, yeah, like, you, usually you, you might say, oh, is he like Jaron Jackson Jr.? Where, I mean, you look, you look at his college stats and you say they're not amazing. He doesn't shoot well, doesn't put up more than 10 points, limited minutes. So maybe you make, the, like, the per 40 or the per 40 argument, uh, since the 40 minutes in college, obviously. So maybe you make that argument. But it, it, Jaron Jackson Jr. at least had a frame that it was like, oh, he's 6'11", he's 230, 240. Uh, he's got an NBA body. His wingspan's like crazy. You know, this guy doesn't really have that. But he, he is slotted in, in most mock drafts to be a lottery pick. Um, but even still, at that four seems like a bit of a stretch, especially when you pass on guys like uh, who, who play the same position. Now, just because Chicago picked a forward, it's already perplexing because you've got Laurie Markkinen, you've got Wendell Carter Jr. You've, you've got pieces that you're already building around that I don't think – uh, I don't think Patrick Williams is better than or, or looks to be better than, uh, but maybe you play him at the three. I don't know. But uh, in an already crowded front court, uh, you, you add him in, and it just didn't, doesn't really make a whole bunch of sense, especially when, you know, you have Obi Toppin or Onyeka Okongwu who, play the sa- who could play the same position for you if you really did want to upgrade it in the front court. Uh, you've got, you know, better players, according to experts, uh, to go ahead of him. But, yes, Patty, Patty Williams, or Patrick Williams – incredibly perplexing pick i would agree with yeah that. yeah maybe he had a crazy workout with the bulls or something uh, so they know something we done they did come out in detail why they chose him um, and you know obviously great talent whatever etc uh, knows how to play his role you know i think patrick williams actually recently tweeted about how like you know he coming off the bench 26 man of the year allowed him to learn how to play his role in the nba because you know that the nba is all about you know being able to play your role not everyone's going to be lebron james but you know lebron james lebron james because he can do everything right and so what he's essentially saying is like he knows what he can do and he can do that well right but i mean of course that's what nba players come in come in to do but the point is that if you have the fourth pick in the draft you know, I don't care how good you're, you know, six man can be better than some of the stars, I'm sure, right? Like not all, at, at, you know, Florida State, not only did they get drafted, but if no one on the team even got drafted, you know, not only ahead of him, right? So he's coming off the bench with five players playing ahead of him, and he goes by far ahead. I, I believe one other Florida player got drafted too uh, last night as well. But the point is, like, it just feels like there's something we don't know. Hopefully it pans out for him, but especially a loaded front court that is very young, like you said, Wendell Carter, Lori Market. And it would make a little more sense if they had a veteran presence, maybe. But the Bulls, very young team. Interesting to see how this plays out. They look like, I don't know, maybe they want one more lottery pick, you know, <laughs> trying to run it back one more year. <laughs> yeah, I also thought it was really weird because they also picked, I think my biggest, my biggest loser is definitely the Bulls, just because um, I think you could have gotten more with the fourth pick. Uh, if Patrick Williams was your guy, you could have traded down, maybe gotten some assets. But uh, yeah, collecting yeah, that, that early on. Yeah, like I, I, maybe they did field offers. Obviously, we were speculating here, but you know, I would have at least tried to trade down from four to like seven or eight. You know, and and you know, the Knicks were the they drafted Obi at uh, seven or eight, and you know, the Knicks potentially. I, I guess they probably you know since Lamelo just gone at three, they probably wanted to wanted to trade up. But there were a lot of teams. You know, the Celtics were trying to trade in the top three. There were a lot of teams that I know we're trying to trade up, but I guess after, you know, we talked about in previous video, there's that tier of the top three players after LaMelo, you know, it kind of falls off. So maybe in that fourth pick, they didn't get what they were looking for back, but I still think they could have waited on Patrick Williams, you know? Um, So, you know, we we're speculating here. Don't know, but it definitely seems a little perplexing from the standpoint of the bulls. Another team I really think was really confusing in the draft was the Hawks. Um, You know, Onyeka Kongu, great pick, but, they have Capella. They've got John Collins already in that front court as well. Uh, Andrew Neck is hurt. Did you see he hurt his foot? He looks yeah, like he's probably going to miss training camp at the start of the season. Yeah, Capella didn't even play for him last season either. So, uh, I mean, maybe maybe we, maybe they did something about Capella that we don't know. Or, you know, Onyeka, oh, so. you got to assume that that foot injury is not going to be too big because we've seen, we've seen those kind of injuries affect guys like Nerlens Noel and, um, or just, you know, lower extremity injuries like, like Joel Embiid. Uh, Nolan as well. We've seen that affect other people's draft stock before. Um, yeah, but bull, I, bull last year. I mean, yeah, yeah. And so you know, it, that can obviously affects them. But Onyeka Kongu kind of added to the front court. I, I would assume Atlanta's got more more 
to come, or maybe they're going to bring Onyeka on uh, a little bit slower than you know you would with a with a top ten pick. Uh, that could yeah, be I, think, I think that's that's where they're coming from. I think their game plan, barring any injuries, is that they're going to be starting Collins and Capella together, yeah. and you know they're going to bring Onyeka off off the bench. But I mean, uh, you, of course, he's going to need time, time. What? Yes, yeah, so you also got to find room for Cam Reddish too, because he can play the four yeah. as well. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, if he bulks up a little bit, I don't know. Last time I saw him playing, he looked a little skinny out there <laughs> playing small the three. Ball. Small ball. <laughs> uh, you can yeah, put anyone at center with small ball. <laughs> you got Kevin Herter out there and Trey Young, and now you just got Cam Reddish. got the boys <laughs> locked down. You know, sometimes you can put Iggy. You can put Iguodala at the five and be fine. You know, you never know with today's NBA. Um, mm-hmm. But, hey, before we, before we kind of sign off, I want to talk about some of the trades uh, that mm-hmm. were made on draft night. Now, um, in our Detroit Pistons take that we, we put on the Instagram story and we also put on the, on TikTok, um, we talked about how uh, Detroit's adding Killian Hayes was really good to add with Luke Kennard because uh, of all the progress that Luke Kennard showed going in the pick and roll last season, even though he was injured for the majority of the season. Still looked really freaking good uh, for, for, like, finally in his third year. But now he's a Los Angeles Clipper, uh, which I think is a huge, huge addition. Uh, for the Los Angeles Clippers to make, especially since they, you know, they lose Landry Shamit, but in, in a way, I would say upgrade to Luke. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. That switch. Maybe not in terms of shooting, but every other standpoint, I would prefer Luke Kennard over Shamit. You know, Kennard, like you said, had injury problems, uh, banged up his, you know, his knee. He didn't really play last year, so I don't know if injury concerns played a role in them dealing him. But yeah, if I'm the Clippers standpoint, that's a dub. Like, okay, I'll take Luke Kennard. Um, yeah. It sounds good. Uh, yeah, another trade you want to talk about um, with Dallas yeah, sending yeah. over Seth Curry for Josh Richardson yeah. in a pick. Dallas, I think Dallas got a huge win there. I mean, I know. Like, I, I think Josh Richardson is better anyway. <laughs> just feel like it's not enough. Like Josh Richardson, like I mean, that guy defensive. If he's on the cusp of being a defensive. I don't want to yeah. say superstar because that might be a little over exaggerating. Yeah, that, don't, don't, don't drop that. <laughs> He's better than Tim Hardaway Jr., I'll tell you that, <laughs> alongside Luke, uh, Luca. I think that's a great pickup for them. Uh, Dallas getting Seth Curry, I think that's also a great pickup. I mean, it gives them a better, better in terms of offense, but you need a guy like Seth Curry to complement Ben Simmons. Uh, just yeah. for Josh Richardson going over to Dallas to help Luke on the defensive end. I think that's a great pickup for both teams. What were your thoughts yeah. when you saw that? Yeah, I mean, Sixers, I'd probably still want to keep Richardson, but I do see how, you know, if you've got Ben Simmons playing as your point forward and starting at the point guard, you definitely need good shooters surrounding them. And that's when the Sixers are playing well is when they have those shooters surrounding them. Um, you know, Shake Melton coming out, you know, towards the last year, shooting the ball well. So I think they saw that and they're thinking, okay, who's a guy that can kind of fill that role and shoot effectively? Okay, we'll take, you know, can't get Seth, Steph, so we'll take his little brother, um, you know, a guy who's led the league. You know, so, you know Seth, Seth, he doesn't he doesn't got the strap. He doesn't pull it a lot, but, you know, he has led the league in, in three-point percentage before. Um, doesn't get a lot of looks, though, uh, but definitely a guy who can stretch the four for the Sixers. However, I still think Josh Richardson's a better player, younger, and looks like he has more promise in terms of his career trajectory, like you said, not only from a defensive standpoint, but I think he can still has room to improve offensively. You know, wasn't much of a shooter on Miami, started to shoot the ball more, you know, obviously coming into the league, started shooting it more on, on Philadelphia. I'm sure he's going to continue this progression, right? So he comes in as an athletic driver who can play good defense, right? And now he's – advancing his game. Seth Curry, I feel like, you know, his player caliber is kind of maxed out. Like, you know, he, he can take more shots. Sure, you know, his points can increase per game, but like you're not going to see any more development in his game. Like I think you could, you're going to see with Josh Richardson still developing and definitely a defender that's going to help Dallas going forward aside with Luka. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely think Dallas won that, but I can see why the Sixers still did the trade and, you know, Daryl Morey, my boy, he's making a lot of moves, a lot of moves. <laughs> yeah. I think I would also rather have Josh Richardson too, but uh, I think, you know, also they, they fit the needs of both their teams now. Uh, it makes sense. And also uh, with Shamit no longer being a Clipper, he's not a Piston. He's now on the clip on the, uh, on the nets also gives them a secondary playmaker. Uh, alongside Kyrie, KD, and, uh, you know, maybe James Harden. I don't know you want to talk about that. Uh, <laughs> but I think that was, a, that was a good pickup. They definitely need that. Uh, I know they're not they're not keeping Garrett Temple anymore, so I think Shamit, um, yeah, they, they kind of play similar, a playmaker, shooter, maybe play defense every once in a while. I think that's a, a good, a younger version uh, and a great pickup for them as well. Hey, guys, thank you so much for watching. If you like this snippet of our podcast, make sure you like the video and leave a comment of your thoughts on the topic we talked about. And make sure to subscribe and click the bell icon so you don't miss any future videos. Also, 
If you want to watch the podcast in its entirety, you can find us on Spotify, which is linked in the description below with our Instagram and our Twitter, which you should also be following. All you have to do is click the links below. Thank you again for watching. We can't wait to see you next time.